So we, last week we looked at RSA and we introduced the algorithm and we went through the example of how do we come up, or why do we need these steps for generating the key? That is, if we say the algorithm is the, to encrypt is we take our plain text message and raise to the power of E mod N, then we need to make sure that when we decrypt we get the correct plain text back. And therefore we went through the steps for how do we generate the keys, where the, the values are the values of E, the public exponent, D, the private exponent, and N. And we went through an example of uh, using RSA. We may see a few more examples of RSA today. We've missed or skipped over some slides which we're going to return to and say a few more things about RSA. Uh, what we went through last week, I wrote a fair bit on the board, but in this handout which you have in front of you as well, to, at the end of the, this set of lecture notes, it describes or writes down some of that discussion from last week. So if you didn't follow everything of how do we derive the keys in RSA, then it's in these handouts here. And there's some examples as well in the lecture notes. So RSA can encrypt our data and different from symmetric key cryptography, we have two different keys and importantly the two users do not need to exchange a secret beforehand. Because with RSA, I have a public key and a private key, as do other users. I, to encrypt, to encrypt a message to send to someone else, I encrypt with their public key. So there's no need for some secret exchange of keys before I send the, uh, the message. I just ask them for their public key and they publish it on a website, in an email, or, or give it to me somehow, and I can encrypt and send confidential information to them. So that's a very good feature of RSA and in general public key cryptography, this independence of a, a shared secret key. And effective, if we use long enough keys, we'll talk about the length a bit later, but if we use large enough values, it's considered secure. That is, if our modulus n is large enough, for example, a 2048-bit number may be recommended, even a 1,000-bit number is considered secure in some cases. If the numbers are large enough, RSA is considered as secure and there are no known techniques uh, that make it any less secure than our block ciphers like AES and triple DES. So what's the problem with RSA? If we've got RSA, why would we still need something like AES or triple DES? Anyone have an idea? What, what may be wrong or problem with RSA? If we say it's about as secure as the block ciphers, why do we still need the block ciphers? Slow. RSA is slow. Okay. Performance, not really from security, but it performs much worse than the block ciphers. And that's a significant problem. You have used, in one of your homeworks, you used OpenSSL, which is in fact two things. It's a program, a command line program to encrypt using different ciphers and in fact do different security operations like it can generate RSA keys. It's also a library in that if you write your own software you can call the OpenSSL function. So you don't have to implement RSA, you don't have to implement triple DES. Your own software calls the, the functions of OpenSSL and they implement it for you. And one nice thing is that because it implements many different ciphers, we can compare the performance. Uh, it has a built-in speed test, OpenSSL speed, and we can either run it and it will test all possible ciphers, but I don't want to wait for too long. I'll just select some ciphers, DES, AES, 
RC4, remember we covered RC4, the first two, DES and AES, are block ciphers. RC4 is a stream cipher, which should be faster than the block ciphers, and we'll also add RSA there. And what that does is OpenSL does some tests, and you can see for three seconds it, it encrypts using RC4 some, some data, in this case 16, 16, byte, uh, uh, 16 bytes of data, and it just times how long, or counts how many encryptions it can do. And at the end it's going to report some statistics of how fast it, each of those ciphers can be applied. And it does for different combinations. Which one do you think is going to be the fastest of those four ciphers? DES, AES, RC4, RSA. Which one? Hand, we'll have a vote. You've got four options. DES, AES, RC4, RSA. Which one do you think is going to be the, the fastest? Hands up for DES. Okay. A A E S. No one. R C four. Anyone? Two or three people. What about R S A? Well, hopefully no, because we just said R S A. The problem with it is it's too slow. Let's have a look at the results. And it takes some time. Uh, it takes a lot of time, in fact, because it, in fact it tries different key lengths with A E S you can have different key lengths, 128-bit key, 192-bit key, 256-bit key. So it's done AES, but above it it's done DES and RC4, it's doing RSA now. RSA is a bit different. Because it's slow, it's not normally used to encrypt large chunks of data. It's only used to encrypt small pieces of data. And that limits its application to not so much for encrypting messages, but for authenticating messages. To making sure that the message we receive is correct, has not been modified, and comes from the right person. So with RSA, the tests are slightly different. They run for 10 seconds. Again, RSA can have different length keys. In fact, it's normally the modulus N which is specified. So a 512-bit modulus N, a 1024-bit, and a 2048, and it even tries 4096. The recommended values nowadays are 1024 and preferably even 2048. But the larger the value, we'll see the much slower they are. This gives some the summary statistics. Let's see if we can get it a bit nicer. It's wrapped around, but uh, let's see. And I'll just make notes of some of them on the board. Because there are many different values. With the stream and block ciphers, so RC4, DES, it also does triple DES, EDE3, AES with the different key sizes. The, the OpenSL speed test tried different size of messages. So it encrypts a 16-byte message and then does it again and then again and again and again and it counts. And then it did it for 64-byte messages. Let's just focus on the first column, the 16-byte messages. With Let's try our first cipher that we covered, DES, with 16-byte messages. DES using CBC, the mode of operation. This is 51,501 kilobytes per second. That's the speed at which you can encrypt. 51,000 kilobytes, which is what? 51.5 megabytes per second. So it's just encrypting a lot of data. And the measurement here is saying using these small messages, you can encrypt, encrypt it about. 51 megabytes of data per second. Okay. Let's look at the others. DES, triple DES, 
EDE3 means encrypt with DES, decrypt with DES, encrypt with DES, with different keys. So the triple DES here. All right, three DES. The speed is here, 18862 kilobytes, 18 megabytes per second. 18.9 megabytes per second. Approximately one third of single DES. Because all triple DES is really is applying single DES three times. Therefore, it's going to be three times as slow as single DES. Okay? We want to be able to encrypt more megabytes per second. So DES is, of course, approximately three times faster than triple DES. But triple DES is more secure because it uses multiple keys that increases the key length. The problem with single DES is it uses a, or it has effectively a 56-bit key. Tri triple DES uh, increases the key length, but at the expense of performance. Let's focus on AES with a 128-bit key. AES, 128-bit key, 80 megabytes per second. 80.3 or 80.4 megabytes per second. So AES, which is a, about the same strength as triple DES, is about four times faster than triple DES. So there's the advantage of AES compared to DES and triple DES. It's secure and fast compared to the others. So. AES was designed with the performance in mind. So they designed the algorithm considering that, uh, uh, or trying to optimize so that also considers performance. Now, there's some other things that are happening here. Although it's not shown, some, so my, I ran this on my laptop, which is a mobile uh, Intel i7 processor. Some processors support AES instructions in hardware. Okay? Normally our encryption is done in, in software. So it's just encrypted uh, in software on my computer. But Intel have something called AES-NI. Uh, I can't remember what NI means. Um, new instruction or uh, I'll see if I can find during the, the break but it's a set of instructions that the processor executes that implements some parts of the AES algorithm in hardware which makes it much faster so if your, your CPU supports this feature and it's common in most recent uh, Intel processors then instead of encrypting everything in, in software it offloads some parts of the AES encryption, some parts of the rounds to the, the, the chip, the processor, and that does some encryption and speeds things up. So some ciphers are supported in hardware as well. What else do we see? So there are the three block ciphers. We have different key lengths slows things down a bit. You see with AES from 128, 192, so increasing the key length decreases the speed. That's a, a, a general trade-off. The longer the key, the more secure, but the slower, the, the encryption. RC4, the stream cipher. Up the top, 340 megabytes per second. more than four times faster than AES in this case. So that's the benefit of the stream ciphers in this case, their speed. You can even see if you use larger blocks that the, they increase in speed up to 600, 650 megabytes per second. So the stream, cipher are built, the stream ciphers are built for speed. But as you 
saw in your exam, there are some problems if you use the keys uh, inappropriately in a stream cipher. You shouldn't repeat the, the key and uh, the same plain text because you may be to dis or from the cipher text you may be to discover the the plain text. So you use initialization vectors uh, in in the right way to make sure that stream ciphers are secure. Last one, and it's reported differently because RSA is not used to encrypt large blocks of uh, data at once because it is slow. What it's used and we haven't covered it yet, but it's used to provide signatures uh, to authenticate where this data came from. So we have mentioned the fact that we can encrypt using the public key and then decrypt using the private key, but we can also use the keys in the opposite direction. Encrypt something with the private key and send that message to our destination and then the destination can decrypt with their with with the sender's public key to verify where it came from so what I do is I encrypt the message with my private key send it to you you decrypt with my public key if it successfully decrypts it confirms that I encrypted it because only I could have encrypted it with the private key so that's an authentication feature it's the concept of me signing a message, putting my signature to the message so that when someone receives it, they are sure it came from me, not someone pretending to be me. So OpenSL reports the time to sign a message. That's at the sender. I would sign the message. I would send the message to someone else and the other person would verify the signature. So the signature, the signing part is performed using a private key and the verification part is performed using the public key. So it reports both of them. Number of signatures per second, let's focus say on a typical 1024-bit uh, uh, RSA. 4,000 signatures per second. Okay. And it's only signing a small amount of data most likely I think in the order of 128 bits, 16 bytes. So if we compare to this column, signing 435 times per second and if here we've got, with the others we've got in the order of tw at, at least 20 or close to 20 megabytes per second. 20 million bytes per second. Let's say each signature was just 16 bytes, which I think is the typical size. If we multiply by this by 16, what do we get? 16, about 64,000 64, bytes per second. So roughly in the order of 64 kilobytes per second versus 20 megabytes per second. So it's at least a thousand times slower than the block ciphers. Don't worry too much about the numbers. The point is that okay, here we're doing thousands per second. Here we're doing millions per second. There are some slight differences in, in the size of the blocks that they operate on. This 1024 is not the size of the data. It's the, the length of the modulus n. RSA is much slower when we have to sign data. And verification is faster than signing. So what is it? About 10, at least 10 times faster in this case. What's the difference between encrypt and decrypt operations in RSA? If you look at them Encrypt, or the first one operation, m to the power of e mod n, and the decrypt is the same operation. The only thing that's different are the values. And in practice, the values of e and d. Normally, e, which is the public value, is small. And therefore, taking some number and raising it to a small power, to a small number, 
is much faster than taking some number and raising it to a large exponent. So normally, E is much smaller than D. We'll talk about why later. Therefore, when we encrypt or we, when we use E, the public exponent, using RSA, it's much faster than we use D, the private exponent. Because it's slower to raise a number to a large power than to a small power. And that's what's happening in the signature and verification. In the signature part, the sign, what's happening is we're taking some value and raising to the power of D mod N. And the verification is taking the receive value and raised to the power of E mod N. And because E is usually much smaller than D, the verification is usually much faster than the signing. And that's what we see here. The, it's about 10 times, at least 10 times faster with verifying than signing. But in both cases, much slower than the others. Yep. All right, so we need to be careful in the terminology. A sign is uh, decryption. In RSA, we can use... In RSA, we can use... Uh, we can use the algorithm for confidentiality or authentication. And when we use it for confidentiality, it means we've got a message and we want to send it to someone such that no one else can read the message. That's our normal form of secure communications. That's the same as when we use DES, triple DES and so on. We take our message, encrypt with a, uh, some key and send it. When we're using RSA, what we do, we take our message to encrypt for confidentiality, take our message, and we raise it to the power and mod by n. What do we raise it to the power of? E, more specific, E of who? we raise it to the power of the public E of the recipient. Okay? That is, if I want to encrypt something and send to you, I need your value of the public key, your value of E. So what I do is I take the message I want to send, raise it to the power of E, mod N, I get my ciphertext, send the ciphertext, and the receiver takes the ciphertext and uses the opposite value. Instead of E, D, the private value, mod N, and gets M back. That's for confidentiality, making sure the message is secret. But we can use E and D in the opposite direction. Remember, E is the public value, and D is private. what I can do is I take a message I don't care if someone else sees the message what I want to make sure and especially the recipient wants to make sure that the message came from the person who they say they are so what I do is I create a message and I use I use the RSA algorithm and I use as the exponent D my private value only I have D and when I send that value of C to you, what you do is you take my public key, in particular my value of E, and you take C raised to the power of E mod N and you get the original message back. This is the authentication operation. It's the receiver making sure that the message came from me. Because if someone else sent it, if you try to decrypt using my public value, my public E, then it will only be successful if I encrypted it with my private D. And the only person in the world that has my private value of D is me. 
which confirms it must come from me if it's successful. So, yes, this is the, well, this op these four operations are all the same. It's the same equation. We just change the variables, or change the, the, yeah, the, the variables here. So it's all take some value, raise it to the, some exponent, mod n. It's just in what order do we use them? For confidentiality, we use the public E and then the private D. For authentication, we use the private D of the source and then the public E of the source at the recipient to authenticate. And this is what's being done in this open SSL speed test. We'll come back to this authentication. We've got a few more topics on it, in fact. But uh, try and understand the difference here between confidentiality and confirming that the message came from the right person. In fact, let's, let's return and discuss that a bit more now. The point here was the, the speed. Stream ciphers are fastest, RC4 in our case. Then block ciphers, AES is, is quite common in use today. It's got fast software implementations and also some hardware support. DES, triple DES, uh, getting old in that they're uh, much slower to use. And public key cryptography is much, much slower than symmetric key cryptography. And that's the main limitation. And hence, in practice, it's, it's not very often used to encrypt files, for example, or to encrypt data as you're sending it across a network. It's mainly used for signing and verifying. Let's go back and talk about some general aspects of public key cryptography and to finish this topic. And just make this concept of authentication and confidentiality clear. So we're going backwards now. Just repeat some things we've already said. These two slides show this concept of encrypting with a public key and encrypting with a private key. Encrypting with the public key we use for confidentiality, keeping the message secret. So Bob has a message he wants to send to Alice. He doesn't want anyone else to see that message. So Bob encrypts that message using an, a public key encryption algorithm, for example RSA, it doesn't have to be, using Alice's public key. Everyone knows Alice's public key. Ciphertext is sent. If DARF intercepts, then what can DARF, the malicious user, do? Then to decrypt successfully, DARF needs, needs to know Alice's private key. And of course, by definition, Alice's private key is not known by anyone else except Alice. So, so long as you cannot determine the one key from another and that the algorithm is strong, then someone who intercepts this ciphertext cannot get the original plain text unless they have the corresponding private key. Encrypted with Alice's public key, it can only decrypt with Alice's private key. And only Alice has that, so only Alice can see the message. That's confidentiality. That's what we normally use our block ciphers for. But it's slow when we use RSA. If we want to encrypt large, large messages, what we commonly use RSA and public key cryptography for is this approach, encrypting with a private key. Bob has a message to send to Alice Bob doesn't care if someone else sees that message. That's not the idea here. The idea here is that when Alice receives a message, 
She wants to be certain that it came from Bob. It didn't come from Darth pretending to be Bob. So in this case, Bob encrypts using his own private key and sends the ciphertext and something that's encrypted with one private key will only successfully decrypt with the corresponding public key. So Alice, thinking it came from Bob, decrypts and it will decrypt successfully because if it was encrypted with Bob's private key, Alice decrypts with Bob's public key, which everyone knows. And because it successfully decrypts, Alice is certain that this message came from Bob. What if some other user, Darth, our malicious user, sent a message to Alice saying, this is a message from Bob, with the intention to fool Alice to thinking it came from Bob, what can Darth do? Darth cannot encrypt this message with Bob's private key, okay? Because they don't have Bob's private key. So the only thing that Darth could do would be to try and maybe encrypt some message with someone else's private key, his own private, private key. So if Darth creates a message, encrypts with his own private key, sends to Alice saying this is from Bob, then what Alice does to verify is Alice decrypts using Bob's public key. And that will be unsuccessful because if it's encrypted with Darth's private key and Alice decrypts with Bob's public key, that two, uh, they're mismatching keys. They're not from the same pair. And therefore, it will not successfully decrypt. When you decrypt with the wrong key, you'll get some indicator of that. And then Alice will know, ah, this did not come from Bob. It came from Bob if it successfully decrypts with Bob's public key. If it doesn't, it must have come from someone else or something went wrong. And that way Alice will know that uh, they have to somehow other, and some other means, confirm with Bob what's happening. So this is for authenticating where the message came from. Confirming that the message came from Bob not from someone else. You can combine the two. This encrypting with a public key provides confidentiality. Encrypting with a private key provides authentication. Maybe you want both. You want your message to be secret and you want to confirm where it came from. Then in fact you can combine the two. Take your message and encrypt with Alice's public key, then encrypt with Bob's private key and send the result. And then you do the two operations. So you can combine the, the operations together. Of course, it makes it twice as slow because we need to do encrypt at both sides, uh, at the sender twice and decrypt at the receiver twice. So that's what the OpenSL speed test did, the signing and verifying. This is just a different representation of those diagrams, a, a more formal representation which shows the notation, but the same idea. For secrecy or confidentiality, encrypt with a public key, decrypt with a private key from the same key pair. And the attacker an analyst here has the goal of trying to determine what X is, what the message was, if they can find the message they've been successful, and or find the private key. If somehow they can find the private key of B then they defeat the system because it's no longer private. And with authentication we encrypt with a private key and decrypt with the public key. Here there's no intention to find the message. The message is sent in the clear. We can find the message uh, from the attacker's point of view. But if the attacker, the analyst, can find the private key, then they defeat the security of this system. And we can combine the two. Here, encrypt with a private key of the source, 
encrypt with a public key of the destination, send the result Z, and then decrypt with a private key of the destination and decrypt with a public key of the source for authentication. So this provides both, what do we say, secrecy or confidentiality and authentication. Provides both of those services. So public key cryptography can be used for different security services. There are different algorithms. Here is a list of four common algorithms. We've looked just at RSA. It's maybe the most popular one, maybe the most famous one. But there are others. There's something based on elliptic, elliptic curve cryptography. RSA uses modular arithmetic. There's different types of ar arithmetic, an elliptic curve. Uh, some, uses some different mathematics to perform encryption. Diffie-Hellman key exchange. We will cover that one, a way to exchange keys. And the digital signature standard, another way to sign things. So just different algorithms. RSA and elliptic curve can be used for encrypting data, for confidentiality. They're not commonly used for it, but they can be. They can be used for signing information, performing authentication, and for key exchange, which is a way to exchange a secret key from A to B via some network. Diffie-Hellman is built for key exchange, and we'll, we'll talk more about key exchange when we talk about Diffie-Hellman and how it works. The digital signature standard was built not for encrypting or confidentiality, but for signing things. So they have different purposes, these algorithms. So what do we need for public key cryptography to work? We need to be able to generate keys. So every user needs a pair of keys. So the algorithm for generating the keys must be easy to perform. By easy we mean can perform, can operate in a matter of milliseconds, seconds normally. Okay. So if I want to generate my key pair, I need an algorithm and software to do that for me and it should be reasonably fast. It shouldn't take forever. Note that the keys are related. As we saw with RSA, the keys, the values of E and D, are related some way. It should be easy for some, some user A, if they know a public key, and some message M to create the ciphertext. Okay? They need to be able to encrypt, apply the, the operation to encrypt. And it should be easy for the other entity to decrypt. So it should be easy to apply our algorithm using one key and apply the algorithm using the opposite key to get the same message back. Now that, that's normal requirements. You, we must be able to encrypt and decrypt. Now for security, so they are mainly for performance reasons, for security what we need is that it's practically impossible or computationally infeasible for an attacker if they know the public key and they know the ciphertext C to determine the private key. The ciphertext will be known, C will be known, it's sent across the network. The public key, PUB, will be known because by definition it's public. So if the attacker knows those two values, we need an algorithm such that it's, it takes too long for them to determine what the private key is. Because we need the private key to remain private. Similar it should be computationally infeasible for the attacker to know, to determine the message M. Okay? 
if they know C and the public key, then they shouldn't be able to find out what the original message was. If I encrypt using my public key a message and I get a ciphertext, I send that ciphertext, if you can determine the message without knowing my private key, then that's not secure. And that's what this one's saying. If you don't know, oh, if you know the public key in C, you still should not be able to be able to determine M, the message. Now, some of the algorithms, RSA in particular has this property, not all of them, that we can use the keys in either order. That is shown here. If we encrypt, if we take some message and encrypt with a private key, and we decrypt with the public, corresponding public key, we get the original message back. So we use the private key and then the public key. Or the other order. If we have some message and encrypt with a public key and then decrypt with a corresponding private key, we get the message back. Then that's a feature that's supported by some algorithms. We can use the keys in either order. Not all the algorithms support that. RSA does. Because RSA, that's what we have here. Encrypt with the private value, decrypt with the public value, or encrypt with the public value E, decrypt with the private value D. RSA we can do in either order. So importantly for security, an attacker cannot determine the private key, nor find the message given the ciphertext, assuming they know the public key in the algorithm. Now, what's, what algorithm, what are the features of the algorithm to provide those security services? Well, those requirements lead to some, a, a need for some algorithm or a function that is considered or called a trapdoor one-way function. So let's look at the, the definition or the informal definition of such a function. We need a function that performs our encryption and decryption. We need to be able to find an inverse, a unique inverse. Because we know when we encrypt and decrypt, if we encrypt some value and get ciphertext, and then decrypt that ciphertext, we must get the same plain text back. Okay? That's our normal requirement for security. If we encrypt M, and get C and then decrypt C, we must get the same M back. If we get a different M, it doesn't work. Okay, so we need a function such that the, there's an inverse and it's unique. Should be easy to calculate. So that we can encrypt in reasonable time, the function must be simple to calculate. But the inverse of the function, so some function which we apply which is easy when we apply that function, but when we do the inverse, it should be hard to calculate unless some information is known. So, We need some function that takes some input, x, and returns some output, y. This function is, our, is going to be our uh, public key cryptography algorithm. What are the requirements on that function? That we can easily calculate this, that we, and defined here, 
it's easy to calculate that function if what have we got? I think there's a mistake here as well this should be x easy to calculate if k and x are known okay. so if we have the the key k and the input x we can easily find y we need such a function but the inverse of that function f to the minus 1 if we know the input y and the, the key k we can apply the inverse and easy to get x which is equivalent to we'll see our decrypt operation if we know the key it should be easy to encrypt that's what this one's saying and the second one's saying if we know the key it should be easy to decrypt that's all and decrypt is the inverse of the encrypt operation but it should be infeasible practically impossible to given y so y is known but the key is not to find x so decrypt if you don't know the key that should be impossible so these are similar requirements that we've said for uh, all of our cycles <coughs> so what do we mean by easy what's in infeasible well there are different ways to measure that one of them you look at the computational complexity of the algorithm so choose a function that meets these requirements a common way to measure is to say that some function is easy if it can be solved in polynomial time as a function of the input so if it can only be solved in say exponential time then it's not considered easy so there is and I think you've seen in, in, in several or in at least one other course uh, computational complexity we can analyze algorithms and see how complex they are and, and give some big order or big O notation to, to indicate the complexity of different algorithms Let's see what have we got. RSA is one such algorithm that meets those requirements. Okay. And we've gone through RSA. What can an attacker do to try and beat public key cryptography? They can try brute force attacks. So if we have a key and the attacker doesn't know the key, try and guess every possible value of the key try all possible values and we know the ways to prevent brute, or at least make brute force attacks hard make the key large okay. so make it such that the attacker must guess many times such that it will take too long the problem so if we make the key large we can avoid brute force attacks but the problem and we started to see with all ciphers we make the key larger they become slower and it's especially for public key ciphers the larger the key, the less efficient the algorithm. Uh, we have still the results here. With RSA, here's uh, we're effectively um, it's n, but an indicator of the length of the, of the key. 512 bits up to 4,000 bits. We see the speed significantly reduces. Increase the security of it. Make a brute force attack harder increasing this value makes the algorithm much slower uh, and just go back to that look at the numbers here we doubled the key length or in fact it's the modulus here but double the length of the input and what have we got a factor of four or uh, eight times slower in that case so we need to manage and consider the trade-off between security preventing brute force attacks and performance efficiency and the result is that most cases public key cryptography is used 
only when encrypting a small amount of data because it's slow and therefore with a large amount of data it takes too long. What other attack can an analysis do? They try and determine the private key from the public key. And we saw that last week when we looked at RSA. With RSA we have a steps for determining E, actually we, we calculate N, select E, and then determine D. D is the private value. If the attacker given E and N can find D, then they'll break RSA. With the algorithms available, there are no known practical techniques uh, to break those algorithms for RSA, for Diffie-Hellman and so on. So they rely on mathematics such that there are functions that it takes too long to solve uh, the equations. For example, discrete logarithms take long, a long time. Uh, factoring large numbers into their prime factors takes a long time. Calculating the totient takes a long time. There are some other types of attacks. Uh, the probable message attack. Is possible we'll see, if, uh, maybe later have an example, but we try all possible values of e the message M using a public key, the public key is known, so the attacker takes many different values of M using the public key and see if the value of C that they get matches the value that the other user has sent and if it does match then they know what M is so they can find the message. It's an attack where you try all possible plain text message. It works if M is small. Okay, then we can try all possible values. And the way to prevent that from work being successful is make M large. And if you have a short message, most algorithms can add some extra random data to that to make it much larger, effectively. So there are simple ways to avoid such attacks. So except under special cases, the algorithms of RSA, DSS, elliptic curve cryptography, Diffie-Hellman are all considered secure in that there are no known general attacks. There may be very specific attacks if you use the wrong values of the parameters, but they can be easily avoided. So they're considered secure so long as the key lengths or the, the parameter lengths are large enough. We have covered how RSA works. We've gone through the steps last week. Key generation. After the break we'll have another example. We'll give you some tasks on generating a key. And in the quiz next week, we'll have a quiz in the lecture next week, you can generate a key and encrypt. So we've seen examples last week. We can apply, of course, RSA works on a, a single number, M. If we have a large amount of data, we can just uh, break it into blocks. And this gives an example that, okay, if we have a large number, we break it into N blocks and encrypt one at a time. So that's a more, more detailed example of applying RSA. The number is a bit big too big to go through in the class. What about the performance and some of the security aspects of RSA to finish? With RSA we take some number M and raise to some exponent E or D and then mod by N. How fast is it to perform such operations? Exponentiation generally is a, is a slow procedure. It takes a lot of time to take some large number and by large numbers we're talking about hundreds of bits in length and raise to some other large number if that other large number, the exponent, is also one hundreds of bits in length then we get a very very large number as an output and computers take a long time to perform that calculation. But in fact 
when we're using modular arithmetic, there are some properties of the arithmetic that make it relatively simple to calculate. So one such property is that we can remember exponentiation really is multiplication multiple times. 2 to the power of 3 is 2 times 2 times 2. Okay? So we can simplify the steps of exponentiation using some of the properties such as uh, this property that if we have some, some large number A, uh, I don't know, 1000 a, a multiplied by 500 mod 200 is the same as 1000 mod 200 multiplied by 500 mod 200 or mod 200 and that makes things simpler because we're just doing a mod of a smaller number and we can break that down to to make it easier for your computer to calculate so even though we're using very large numbers it's possible for doing RSA encryption in reasonable time when we generate keys we need to choose a value of E remember the process is you have two random or two prime numbers P and Q calculate N calculate the totient of N as P minus 1 times Q minus 1 and then select E which is re relatively prime with the totient of N how do you choose a value of E and remember E is public E is the value that we can tell everyone well you can choose different values but because it's public in fact you can use the same value multiple times different people can use the same value and some common values are E equal to 3 so it doesn't have to be large 17, 65537 why these values? using small values is good because when you take some message and raise it to the power of E mod N if E is small then this will be fast to implement because we're just taking some number and raising it to a small power raising some large number to the power of 3 is much faster than raising this large number to the power of a, uh, a very very large exponent okay so a small value makes it perform faster these other values uh, help in some of the operations uh, if you look at them in binary they contain only several values of binary 1 and many values of 0 and you can start to use left shifts um, and perform the multiplication and exponentiation much, fast, much faster so there are some optimal values in terms of performance for E some values there are potential attacks but if you add some random padding that is increase the length of the message those attacks can be avoided so generally the value of E can be the same for multiple users so I have a public key my value of E is 3 you have a public key you can also use the value of E equal to 3 but we should have different values of our modulus N okay. once we have a value of E then we there are algorithms for calculating D and D should be large normally although E can be small and fixed D is our private value no one should be able to guess it so if you have a small value of D there's potential for attacks so generally D should be large and normally it's in the order of almost the same number of bits as n so if n is a thousand bits in length then d is close to a thousand bits in length with e is small there are algorithms for even if d is large how do we use d? we take c raise it to the power of d mod n if c is a large number say a thousand bit number and D is also another large number, a thousand bit number we get a very large result here 
but again we can take advantage of some properties of modular arithmetic to make this manageable to calculate. It's still manageable in reasonable time. In the results we saw with OpenSSL, using E we saw was the verify operation and using D was the sign operation. And just going back. Signing is about 10 times slower than verifying. Because in this case, I don't know what value of E was used, but most likely it was a small value of E and a large value of D. And it meant that this is faster than the signing, uh, the, yeah, the signing operation. So there are some rules or some guidelines that the values of E you can use. D can be calculated. There are algorithms for calculating it. And the other parameters that we choose are P and Q. They are the two prime numbers we start with. They must be private. So when I generate my own pair of keys, I choose a two large prime numbers, P and Q. They must be very large. The reason they need to be large is because the attacker, one of their objectives is to take n and factor it into its primes p and q. If n is very large, then that's considered impossible to do in reasonable time. So if you make p and q very large, you multiply them together, then n will be very large, and therefore an attacker cannot determine p and q from n. Very large, again, we'll see some exa examples, but uh, what was the number? One of the more recent numbers, so the length of n of 768 bits, so a value of 768 bits long of n, took something like two years to factor into its primes p and q. So make p and q large enough such that n is in the order of 1,000 bits, 2,000 bits, and it's considered secure. It's not easy to find large prime numbers though. And what normally happens is they, algorithms choose large random odd numbers. It may be prime, it may not be, it may be composite. And then there are ways to test to, to increase the chance that it is a prime number. So there are ways to, to get a very high probability that, that P and Q are prime numbers. How secure is it? If you choose large enough D, then it makes brute force attacks uh, too slow. Except a large D makes the, inc the operation here slower. Sorry, the signing operation. The mathematical attacks which, which we mentioned last week were you either need to factor N into P and Q, it's two prime factors, that's considered impossible if n is large enough. You determine the totient of n directly. That problem is considered impossible if, again, n is large enough. Or you determine d, for example, by performing a discrete logarithm. And discrete logarithms are considered impossible, again, if our numbers are large enough. There are no known ways, if we use large enough numbers, to perform those mathematical attacks. Most of the measures of security of RSA are based upon the size of n, because the easiest of those attacks is factoring n into its prime numbers. So that's how people measure how secure it is. There are some very specific attacks, timing attacks, taking advantage of how long the implementation takes but there are usually countermeasures, very easy countermeasures that will prevent those attacks. So it's very easy to stop them. Let's just finish with some examples of how long it takes and the size of N. This is a, a bit old, this one's from the textbook, but what have we got? These are how long it takes to factor a large number N. 
And here's the size of n in bits. So a 600-bit number, a 2,000-bit number. And different algorithms have been used to try and factor. Uh, we're not going to cover how they work. I can't even, I, I don't even remember uh, the, the different sieves. And this is the time measured in some uh, um, number of operations to perform. And so MIPS years in this case. Uh, and we're talking about 10 to the power of 9, 10 to the power of 10 MIPS years, where MIPS is a measure of the, the processor speed. But more, maybe more meaningful, RSA, the algorithm, uh, RSA, the company who developed the algorithm, had some competition where you win money if you factor large numbers. And so there was some competition, and you see over the years, so the number of decimal digits and the approximate number of bits. And for example, in 1999, 512 bit numbers. So this is the length of n were managed to be factored into P and Q. How long did it take to factor? 8,000 MIPS years. So a measure of the amount of time, and computation time to, to factor that. And more recently, 2005, 663 bits. And the most recent one, which was part of the competition, that was now stopped the competition, 768 bits. That is N, 768 bits long. It took approximately two years in real time, running multiple computers, hundreds of computers at the same time, trying to factor one number, N, into P and Q. It took about two years of real time to factor the 768-bit n. So if you've got a 1,024-bit n, it should take much, much longer to be able to factor that, given the known algorithms. And if you have a 2,048-bit n, it's considered uh, secure. So it's just a matter of make, making n long enough by choosing large enough p and q. That brings us to the end of RSA. What we'll do after the break is I'll give some examples and you'll have some, some examples of uh, a simple encryption and key generation with RSA. And then if we have time after showing a few examples, we'll look at another algorithm, Diffie-Hellman key exchange. We'll see how far we go. Let's have a break and at 2.40, we will continue with some examples.